the level of fear among our colleagues because they were afraid that they were going to be retaliated against was off the charts. And continue. What is it that would strike fear into the heart of a group of medical professionals at one of America's top hospitals? I said, I don't want to take it. I ultimately gave my notice and I went somewhere else. I was suspended and then terminated. During the height of the COVID pandemic, hospitals and many institutions put vaccine mandates in place. You have the right to put up your hand and say, what the hell is going on here? Please explain this to me. A rare talk with a group of doctors and nurses turned whistleblowers from the first hospital to mandate COVID vaccines. When Elon Musk took over Twitter, he pulled back the curtain on how the social media platform used by presidents and pundits was also being manipulated at the highest level of government. Some of the revelations, Twitter worked with the U.S. government and FBI to discredit the story about Hunter Biden's computer as Russian disinformation, to punish those who were off the COVID narratives, and obtain user IDs and handles of conservative Twitter accounts. This week, we open up the Twitter files. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. The alarm is being sounded at hospitals across the country in critical condition due to staffing shortages. There's an important side of that story seldom heard, the role that COVID vaccine mandates played in those shortages. Today, our cover story comes from Houston, where we have a rare group interview with medical professionals turned whistleblowers from the first hospital in the nation to require COVID vaccines. They see a disturbing health care trend that could ultimately impact all of us. My name is Dr. Venu Jilapali. I was on staff at Houston Methodist The Woodlands and got suspended and ultimately terminated due to the vaccine mandate. You did not want to get vaccinated? No. Dr. Venu Jilapali is among an outspoken group of medical professionals once affiliated with Houston Methodist. Methodist was the first hospital system in the nation to require COVID vaccines. I refused to get the, the vaccine. I spoke out on social media saying vaccine mandates were wrong. And I said, I don't want to take so it. I ultimately gave my notice and I went somewhere else. And I was suspended and then terminated. It's rare to find medical professionals from such a prominent hospital system speaking on camera on the topic. Punished, they say, for using independent medical judgment which they consider a hallmark of sound medicine. Dr. Julapali started an email group of more than a thousand of his colleagues to discuss and debate the policies. Many, he said, would only share their true feelings with him in private. The level of fear among our colleagues, among the medical staff, in terms of expressing their opinion, whatever it was, because they were afraid that they were going to be retaliated against, by the institution, Houston Methodist, was off the charts and continues to be off the charts. Dr. Mary Crow is an oncologist hematologist who, like Dr. Julapali, lost privileges to practice medicine at Methodist for refusing the vaccine. You have the right to put up your hand and say, what the hell is going on here? Please explain this to me and not risk obliteration of your personal and professional life. Dr. Mary Tally Bowden, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, also lost privileges at Methodist. I've tested over 80,000 people for COVID, and that's what first alerted me to what was going on because we keep track of who's vaccinated and who's not. who's not. And the patients who were vaccinated and testing positive were just as sick, if not sicker, than the ones that weren't. And eventually I saw more vaccinated patients testing positive than unvaccinated, and that's when I really became vocal and Methodists did not like that. Houston Methodists began firing unvaccinated employees in June of 2021. CEO Dr. Mark Boom made the controversial vaccine mandate a linchpin of his leadership and encouraged Three others to follow. To safe. I think patients should be demanding this at all hospitals. And frankly, I think you will see the floodgates begin to open at hospitals. We've seen, you know, a whole bunch of hospitals follow suit. It took a couple months, but they've been following suit. Um, and I think you're going to see many, many more. And there were many more. With Houston Methodist leading the pack, within three months it was reported 
that at least 174 health systems were mandating COVID vaccines. The requirements triggering protests and court battles. Father, I just want to put it out to you right now to protect all these employees of Methodist and to tear down the medical tyranny. A lawsuit against Methodist filed by employees got dismissed. The federal judge ruled that the hospital had made a choice to keep staff, patients, and their families safer. Many at Methodist agreed. But these seasoned professionals claim the vaccine mandate didn't make patients safer at all. And they gave numerous accounts of vaccinated employees coming to work ill. Owen Robinson is a critical care registered nurse. At that time, the management in the Methodist ICU for, forced two nurses to come in sick positive with, with COVID, COVID, with symptoms, fevers, and take care of patients in the ICU. So that completely obliterates our argument as far as patient safety, because there's nothing more unsafe than having sick nurses taking care of immunocompromised patients in the ICU. One nurse was so sick, she had a trainee, a new nurse, and she spent the entire day sitting at the desk, most of, most of the time with her head down on the desk because she was so ill and her trainee was taking care of the patients. Robinson says he originally agreed to get fully vaccinated to keep his job, but was fired after he refused the booster. As far as the people who were vaccinated, um, they still got sick anyway. And you were vaccinated. I was fully vaccinated. And you got COVID. And I got COVID. Lots of the nurses in the unit got COVID. Um, and then some of them got COVID multiple times. And then even after the booster came out, there were nurses who were fully vaccinated and boosted who still got COVID more than one time. So we didn't see any efficacy, particularly with the booster. I wasn't going to get the booster because it seemed completely pointless and useless. And so therefore, um, I was terminated. Nurse Carol Avila and Given Fessler, a respiratory therapist, both got religious exemptions from the mandate due to the vaccine's use of cells from aborted fetuses. They were tested weekly for COVID while working at Methodist until last fall. They came out with a new vaccine called the Novavax and they gave us a 10 day warning saying, good news, there's a new vaccine out that does not go against your currently approved um, exemption. I applied for another religious exemption and they came back a few weeks later and they denied it and they gave no reason for the denial. They just said it has not been approved. So? So I ultimately gave my notice and I went somewhere else. I did have COVID in January 2021 and that was also one of the reasons that I didn't want to be vaccinated besides my um, religious uh, beliefs. But um, I also had to get tested every single week, and um, I never tested positive. And then my coworkers who got vaccinated, double, triple vaccinated, they all got it in my area. So it just was a confirmation to me that I did have the antibodies because I've never gotten it again. The religious exemption issue Houston Methodist has made into a joke. I had a religious exemption against the flu vaccine at Houston Methodist. Uh, my religious exemption for the COVID vaccine was denied. My religion has not changed. My very own brother has a religious exemption at Houston Methodist, the Woodlands. Now we have the same religion. There is no rhyme or reason for how Houston Methodist is handling religious exemptions. It's completely arbitrary and capricious. We wanted to hear Houston Methodist side of the story, but a spokesman declined our interview request and did not answer our questions, including one about a particularly contentious allegation. Dr. Jula Polly says his colleague claimed that a high ranking official at Methodist offered her the opportunity to fake getting the vaccine. She told us that it would be done internally. And she told us that when she asked him has this been offered to anyone else? He said, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Methodist declined to answer when we asked whether any employees were offered an opportunity to pretend to be vaccinated. 
We also asked whether the hospital communicated with federal health officials or vaccine makers about the mandates and whether Methodist was offered any financial benefit or gift related to mandating vaccines. A spokesman did not respond. In an interview in June of 2021, Methodist CEO Dr. Boom said the hospital's policies were safety and science driven. Yeah, we've said all along we will be driven by the science. I mean, we are a, a science-based and medically-based institution. We have a faith underpinning. Um, we have a set of very, very strong values as an institution that puts patients at the center. So when people say to me, I don't want to put patients at the center by their actions, yeah, they're not people who are a fit for our organization. Meantime, industry insiders are pointing to a global crisis in healthcare staffing. Italy is countering by reinstalling health care workers who were suspended for refusing the COVID vaccine. In New York, 100 percent of hospitals are reporting nursing shortages. More than 75 percent say other key positions can't be filled and half say they're reducing or eliminating services. Texas, where Methodist is based, is also said to be suffering an ongoing hospital staffing crisis. In a statement, Methodist told us we are not having nurse shortages. That's a big problem. Without Whatever the case, this group insists that punishing highly credentialed health care professionals for their medical judgment will translate to poor patient care in the larger picture. You, our patients, our community, our neighbors, you have the power. We get our power from you. That's exactly You right. have the power to question these hospitals that you're literally putting your lives into their hands, you have the power to question, why is this culture existing? Why are physicians so afraid to speak out when we're supposed to be independent? You, the patient, has the power to question what's going on here. A court has ordered New York City to reinstate 1,750 workers fired over mandates with back pay. The city is appealing. An important update on our reporting about controversial COVID-19 vaccine mandates in the military. The Pentagon finally officially removed the vaccine requirement for military troops. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made the announcement January 10th. Controversy built after it became clear the vaccines don't prevent illness or transmission and that healthy young people serving in the military are at near zero risk of serious illness from COVID. Meantime, military doctors and other whistleblowers gave disturbing accounts of serious adverse events from the vaccine and alleged efforts to cover them up. The military had lost multiple court cases challenging its COVID vaccine policies. Congress eventually passed a law saying troops cannot be required to take the vaccine. Tens of thousands challenged the requirement. Most lost the battle. Ahead on Full Measure, we will break open the Twitter files. When Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter was finalized last October, he quickly instituted sea changes in Twitter's operations, which have become notorious for censoring off-narrative information and views. In the three months since, Musk has released an incriminating stream of internal documents revealing what some experts assess to be proof of shocking government censorship at the highest levels. Today, we examine one of the most significant stories of the information age. On October 5th, 2020, President Trump had just recovered from COVID. Before leaving the hospital, he tweeted, don't be afraid of COVID, don't let it dominate your life. That triggered behind the scenes intrigue at Twitter. A top Twitter lawyer named James Baker weighed in. Baker happened to have been the FBI's lead attorney once criminally investigated for alleged leaks against Trump. Now at Twitter, Baker suggested that Trump's urgings don't be afraid of COVID, violated Twitter's policy against misinformation. Twitter's then head of trust and safety told Baker that optimism didn't qualify as misinformation. But internal documents show Twitter often working at the government's insistence to punish those who are off the COVID narratives, even if it meant rejecting truthful information. August 11th, 2022, a tweet wrongly implied that COVID was killing a lot of children. Twitter didn't touch that disinformation. 
But when another user replied that COVID wasn't even close to a major killer of kids and cited the government's own data from CDC, Twitter labeled that tweet misleading. Other documents show that Twitter, pre-Elon Musk, aided government censorship campaigns. The social media company often accommodated U.S. government demands to push tweets that fit government narratives and suppress dissenting tweets, even if true. March 15, 2021, Harvard Medical School epidemiologist and professor Dr. Martin Koldorf tweeted his expert opinion, shared by many scientists, that those with prior infection and children did not need the COVID-19 vaccine. Internally, Twitter ruled that to be sharing false information, slapped a misleading label on it, shut off people's ability to reply to or like it, and suppressed its visibility. June 19th, 2022, Twitter permanently suspended another medical expert, Dr. Andrew Boston, after deeming his tweets to be misinformation. That included one that simply referred to a peer-reviewed study finding COVID vaccines temporarily reduced semen concentration and sperm count in men. Beyond COVID, documents show there were plenty more topics the government and Twitter coordinated on to stifle free speech. You may already know about the case involving President Biden's son, Hunter. Twitter worked with the U.S. intelligence community and FBI to discredit a story about the shocking contents on Hunter's computer as Russian disinformation. That's despite the fact that the FBI had possession of the computer and knew the story was true. The Twitter files also show federal agencies devoting extensive time and personnel on the taxpayer dime to manage the public message and silence dissenters. A May 11, 2020 email references a monthly U.S. government industry call. The FBI's Elvis Chan coordinated regular sit-downs between numerous government agencies and Twitter. Here, emails refer to meetings July 16th, July 30th, and August 14th, 2020. And Twitter apparently facilitated the Pentagon's vast network of accounts deployed to distribute propaganda. On July 26, 2017, an arm of the U.S. military gave Twitter a list of 52 Arab language accounts used to amplify certain messages. The military asked Twitter to give special treatment and visibility to the accounts, and Twitter agreed. Before the 2020 election, the FBI asked Twitter for user IDs and handles of conservative Twitter accounts listed in an article by the liberal publication Daily Beast, and Twitter's response implied it was good with the request. But perhaps the most important takeaway is that the revelations found in the Twitter files are just a sampling of broader censorship trends. Documents revealed through a lawsuit against President Biden show that managing information on COVID vaccines was a near obsession in the Biden White House. The lawsuit was filed by Missouri and Louisiana. Emails show that White House Digital Director Robert Flaherty and his team lobbied to shut down or censor what they called misinformation, which often turned out to be true information, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all while getting paid with your tax dollars. For example, in January of 2021, baseball legend Hank Aaron died less than three weeks after getting the COVID vaccine. Though many claimed his death was unrelated to the shot, vaccine safety advocate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said that Aaron's death was part of a wave of suspicious deaths among the elderly shortly after vaccination. The next day, the White House team asked Twitter to censor Kennedy. March 22, 2021, the White House's Flaherty pointedly pressured Facebook to step up its game on shaping vaccine information and influencing users, such as promoting content from their friends who have been vaccinated. We have been focused on reducing the virality of content, discouraging vaccines that does not contain actionable misinformation, Facebook assured the White House, noting, this is often true content. On April 22nd, 2021, the White House was grappling with reports of dangerous blood clots after COVID shots, and the CDC and FDA had put a pause on Johnson & Johnson's version. That day, Flaherty wrote to Facebook that misinformation around the vaccine is a concern shared at the highest and I mean highest level of the White House. And on May 12, 2021, 
The day CDC made the controversial recommendation for children to get the COVID vaccine, Flaherty again demanded that Facebook step up operations on removing bad information on vaccines. Some of the big questions raised by all of this, if the government is engaging in unconstitutional acts of censorship, who has the power to stop it? And how did the government's actions impact everything from our elections to the way COVID was mismanaged? We'll keep on it. Coming up next, an update to our reporting on foreign government influence in the U.S. and ties to the FBI. A former top FBI agent who investigated Russian oligarchs is now charged with working for one. Charles McGonagall, who once headed counterintelligence in the agency's New York office, is accused of violating economic sanctions, money laundering, and other crimes. He allegedly agreed to help Russian official and billionaire Oleg Deripaska get off the U.S. sanctions list and investigate a rival. He's pleaded not guilty. After McGonagall retired from the FBI, he allegedly took $225,000 in secret cash payments from Deripaska and a former Albanian intelligence operative. Deripaska is a key figure when it comes to foreign influence in the U.S. Officials from other countries hire U.S. agents to lobby for them with Congress, the media, and federal agencies. All legal as long as the agents register with the government, as we reported nearly five years ago. We analyzed Foreign Agents Registration Act records going back to 2012. Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and energy mogul Oleg Deripaska all hired the U.S.-based Endeavor law firm for business and policy advice. Deripaska paid Endeavor $3.5 million. He'd been banned from the U.S. for alleged criminal ties, which he denies. Strife makes for good business, and when so many are talking about a foreign issue in Washington, D.C., whether it's Russia or Ukraine, you can bet foreign agents are in the background pulling strings. We'll be right back. Coming up next week on Full Measure, the outrageous story of the FBI arresting an innocent scientist on spy charges. These arm agents, you know, with their gun drawn and running into the house and running around and yell, FBI, FBI. And uh, so they ordered my wife and uh, two daughters coming out of their bedrooms with their hands raised. And, and it was very, very scary. It's not the first time the FBI has wrongly charged Chinese-American scientists. We investigate next week on Full Measure. If you want to hear more stories, check out the podcast, Full Measure After Hours. And until next time, I'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching.